is primarily an introduction to what is war and where does engineering fit within the context of war. So the question to what is war, I think the answer is very simple. It's just competition for resources. So it's either the fight to acquire new resources, in which case you have offensive warfare, or the attempt of somebody to retain the resources that they are currently possessing, so that would be defensive warfare. And Koi was obviously one of the more potent reasons for warfare these days, so that's why it included oil. Uh, other reasons are commonly given, so a very common one is national security. So this is, for example, the German invasion of Poland in 1939, which actually followed a series of German false flag attacks under something called Operation Himmler. So over the course of the week before September 1st, 1939, the Germans dressed up as Polish troops and then infiltrated and shot up random German soldiers at border posts. So that then the German mass media could write about Polish attacks on Germany and the need to defend Germany against Polish attacks. And of course there were witnesses because everybody saw people running around in Polish uniforms shooting at each other and you got the invasion of Poland. Uh, another commonly given reason is national pride. So for instance, this is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And after he was assassinated, the Austrian government wanted to use that as an excuse to invade Serbia, even though the Austrians' own commission said there's nothing to prove or even suppose that the Serbian government is accessory to the inducement for the crime or its preparations for the furnishing of weapons. So the Austrian government knew that Serbia, or the Serbian government and the Serbian people had basically nothing to do with the assassination of the Archduke. But still, they went ahead and submitted 11 demands to Serbia, of which Serbia accepted 10, except for the last one, which was that every Serbian town is going to be policed by Austrian officers, which would obviously make Serbia a police state of Austria. And so they refused that. The Austrian mass media started ranting about how Serbia negated and declined all of their terms, even though they were very, uh, very pleasant and very, uh, very neutral, and started up the war against Serbia with pretty much complete support of the public. Uh, Another given reason which is often provided is supposedly religion, where various Spanish and Portuguese conquistadors came to the New World, saying that they're here to enlighten the locals. Of course, the real reason was land and gold, and pretty much everybody understood that, but that was still the reason that was given on paper. Uh, so, if you look at war in general, at the end of the day, the main reason is that you're competing for resources. And a really beautiful example of this was given in the movie Arrival, which came out last year, I believe. And there they were talking about the Sanskrit word gavesti, which is one of the words for war, or for battle. And it's literally derived from, from the words gao, which means cow, and isti, desire. So war is basically a desire for more cows. Doesn't really get more simple than that. And in ancient Hindu mythology, there's quite a few descriptions of wars which were basically cattle raids against neighboring nations. So if we have, uh, if we know that war is about competing for resources, what kinds of resources are people looking for? Well, the most obvious one is food, such as the aforementioned cattle raids. Or I suppose cannibalism is another direct example of going to war for the sake of food. Uh, territory. So sometimes the resource you're seeking is extra territory either for your people or for yourself. So this is an example of the German plan for the Lebensraum, so living space, right? At, during World War II, the Germans were planning that they would take over most of the European sector of what used to be the Soviet Union and pretty much everything else in between. And all of that would be the new living space for the great and wonderful German people. And whatever happened to the people who happened to live there was not anybody's business. Most of them were supposed to be dead anyway, so it wouldn't have mattered. Uh, material wealth. So this is probably the most ironic reason to go to war, because these are two wars that were fought over literally bird dung. So back in the 1800s, uh, people from Europe realized that there are islands in the Pacific Ocean which have massive amounts of bird dung. And that bird dung was really rich in nitrogen, so it worked as a perfect fertilizer. So there were two wars. One of them was fought between Spain and South American nations. Another one was fought between a bunch of South American nations among each other. There was a US Congress Act that basically said if any such island is 
ventured upon by your citizen, it becomes sovereign property of the United States. And then if anybody else tries to claim it, this will be the United States Navy can come in and take it because it's only it's sovereign property. Overboard. I mean, it's a resource. Uh, another thing is workforces. So this is an example of Ostarbeiters or Eastern workers who were basically slaves brought in from the Soviet Union and other nations that Germany captured during World War II. So examples of going to war to get slaves go pretty much as far back as time because if you need to do something, you can either do it yourself or you can go and tell somebody else to do it and then kill them if they don't. So I guess in some cases the second option is easier, so that's another resource that is commonly sought in war. Uh, obviously wealth, just directly in terms of money. So this is an example of the ransom for Atahualpa to Francisco Pizarro. So when Francisco Pizarro invaded South America, he went to war with the Incas and he captured their emperor and he demanded a full room of gold in ransom for him. The Incas delivered the gold, he killed the emperor right away anyways. But basically he was literally just there to get a bunch of gold so that he could go back to Portugal and become filthy rich and do whatever filthy rich people do. Uh, regional power is another common reason that people won't want to go to war, so to make sure that nobody challenges your authority and nobody is able to take away your resources. So a good example for this are the Punic Wars, which were fought between Carthage and Rome. And there's a famous uh, Roman senator who ended for quite a while, pretty much every single one of his speeches, with the words, whatever the speech was about, he ended it with the words, furthermore, I consider that Carthage must be destroyed. And this went on because Carthage and Rome had been fighting for a couple, for many, many decades by then. So ultimately, at the end of the Third Punic War, the Romans had completely burned down Carthage and everything else that the Carthaginians had. The legend is that they were so mad at the Carthaginians that they salted the, the fields where the city used to be. There's actually not any historical evidence for that, but it's a popular legend because salting the fields of destroyed enemy cities has occasionally happened. And the reason for uh, salting the fields is basically just to make sure that nothing grows there for the foreseeable time being. So it's basically just to make sure that nothing can be productively done in the location that you just enacted. So whenever you're thinking about war, you have to remember that war is extremely expensive. The most obvious expense is the development and procurement of weapons, and which is most of the topic of this course. So weapons are very expensive to invent. Once you invent them, they're even more expensive to build and maintain. So this is an example of the Swedish ship Vossid. At the time of its launch, it was the largest warship on planet Earth, bristling with guns from multiple decks. Yeah, however, they had a little bit of a miscalculation, so the moment it came out, it sailed for a few hundred feet, and then they forgot to close these bottom hatches, and it just rolled over its head. So, biggest ship in the world, stayed afloat for maybe 10 minutes, Lots of money wasted, but shows that whenever you're building an army, building a navy, nowadays building an air force, there's a lot of costs that go into building everything, which may not necessarily work quite as well as one would expect. <coughs> F-35. Some people will understand that. Uh, another primary uh, location where, or primary uh, place where cost goes, is the trading and upkeep of a standing army. So if you have an army that does not have to tend to its own fields, that doesn't have to engage in any other kind of productive work, you need to make sure that those people are still paid sufficiently over the course of their service life that they can continue to eat and have a place to live and so on and so forth. So an example for this would be Philip II of Macedon who had one of the first true full-time paid standing armies that was his elite cavalry. Before the time of the ancient Greeks, and even during the time of the ancient Greeks, most armies were technically part-time soldiers, where during the harvest season, they would actually go back home and then tend to their fields. And then during the sowing season, they would go back home and then tend to their fields, and really only go and be soldiers if war was happening. But other than that, they had lives outside of soldiering as well. And obviously, compared to somebody who does soldiering 24-7, seven days a week, all of whatever, how many years he serves, they're going to be significantly less effective because they have less training, less sound, and so on and so forth. A very, another important uh, place where, where a lot of funding has to be sunk is supply. So if you go to war, 
you need to make sure that your RV is fed and supplied and given all the ammunition and everything else that it needs while it's moving and while it's fighting the enemy. And when people or nations failed to provide enough logistical support, then their armies went on campaigns and then basically either starved or had to go back or were just completely choked out by the enemy who had food in his own house and was able to deny them the uh, ability to eat of that food himself. So ex an example of that would be the Russians' forced earth policy where as the Russians withdrew during World War II, they burned all their farm fields so that the Germans would not be able to make use of their own food. So then the German logistic alliance ended up stretching pretty much all the way to the border of the Soviet Union as they kept on going deeper and deeper and deeper into the USSR. So with all of this, with all of these costs, war is a very expensive venture. So if somebody is actually going to go to war, it, it, it has to be necessary that the perceived benefits need to outweigh whatever costs are actually going to be required. So you need to have some idea that you're going to go to war, you're going to spend all of this money, all of these resources, but you're going to get more resources back. And for example, if you look at Elric's sack of Rome, he had a lot of return on investment in that campaign because they were nomads, they didn't really care where to live. So the cost of just moving closer to Rome and eventually just pillaging Rome for them would have been significantly lower than for an army that came from an actual fortified city that was somewhere else and who needed supplies from their own city and so on and so forth. So is war natural? So very often we're presented with this dichotomy of there's the, the peaceful natural world with the birds and the bees and the butterflies. And there's the violent human world with people killing each other and slaughtering each other and so on and so forth. It's not necessarily actually true. Violent competition is a thing throughout all of nature. So the most, the most obvious example is if you look at carnivores. They kill other animals to make sure that they get the resources which are those particular animals' meat. So that is a pretty violent way to pursue resources. And from the perspective of the animal that is being eaten, then he has to make sure that he's defending himself. So whether that is by attacking the carnivore, if he has horns or various other defensive mechanisms, or running away, you're still expending then part of your own resources to try to protect the rest of your resources. So whether it's energy or expending something else in return, like a lizard leaving its tail so that the rest of the lizard can get away, you're still expending some of your resources, resources to protect the rest of the resource that you have. I guess primarily life being the most important one. Uh, if you look at this picture, though, you also see competition for resources here. The cows are eating grass. The grass does not necessarily want to be eaten. And it was actually found out in recent years that a lot of plants have defensive mechanisms against being eaten. So if you look at various types of flowering plants, for instance, if you disturb them in a way that is similar to, let's say, a snail eating them, then they start to secrete small amounts of toxins which presumably might have been effective against snails long, long ago. The snails have since adapted, but that amount of small defensive strategy that the plant still tries to put out to protect itself from being eaten by the, by the, by the herbivore is still there. Uh, if you look at carnivorous plants, such as this Venus flytrap, here you're also effectively competing for resources, and you are hoping to kill some animals so that you can digest it and make use of the energy that used to be in his body, such as in this case the wasp, which has important gluten caught and is in the process of being digested. Uh, obviously there's competition between individual carnivores. So if a lion and a group of hyenas are fighting over some dead gazelle or a dead zebra or perhaps a dead giraffe, then they are competing with each other against a resource that perhaps one of them already killed and the other one either wants to take or both of them have found and then both of them want to take in the case of just finding a, a dead animal out in the desert. Uh, competition between plants. So if you look at this picture, you'll think it's the very epitome of peace. But in reality, there's a lot of competition that goes on here because all of these flowers, they're competing against each other for the attention of pollinators. They are competing against each other underground by extending their root networks and trying to push back against the root networks of other plants. They are competing against trees for the resources which are in the ground, because a tree needs significantly larger amount of resources, which is why you technically don't really see 
flowers growing to quite such an extent in forests as you do in the field is because the trees take up so many resources that it minimizes the amount of available nutrients that there are for very rich power units. So if we look at the scale of competition in the natural and the human world, we can start with the cellular. And even if you go to the cellular level, there's still competition, which is often fairly violent, for resources. So one of the common examples would be an amoeba that's hunting and eating a paramecium. The paramecium, in this case, is the little green thing, and the amoeba is everything else in the picture. And in this case, these are just single cells, but they're still killing each other over the question of resources, which in this case is the resource of whatever the paramecium has inside, which is food for the amoeba. Uh, if you can look at the competition between colonies of different cellular or unicellular creatures. So this is an example of competition between two bacterial uh, colonies, where in the top four pictures, you see what happens when those colonies are, are in a single uh, agar dish. And the reason that they're keeping away from each other is that as these bacteria grow, if they detect a bacteria from a different colony, they start to secrete toxins. So effectively, the two bacteria, the two bacterial kinds in this case, are pushing each other away by secreting toxins and then growing in the other direction. And in this case, there's a piece of glass that was separated between them, so they don't know each other's presence, and therefore they spread all the way out to the piece of glass. So even on the unicellular level, you still have the same sort of competition, which technically is somewhat resembling war. Uh, a great example of this is something called the Great Oxygenation Event. So this would have happened around 2.5 billion years ago, as the first cyanobacteria started to develop and produce copious amounts of oxygen, which incidentally would have led to the probably the largest mass extinction in Earth's history. Because up to that time, the Earth's oceans were very poor in oxygen, and the majority of the unicellular creatures or bacteria would have probably been obligate anaerobes, which means that if, if oxygen becomes present, they die because it destroys them. So the moment that cyanobacteria and other, other photosynthetic unicellular organisms appeared and started producing that oxygen, all of those other creatures for whom oxygen was toxic, they just literally were dissolved in that. So in this case, after that, the cyanobacteria effectively took over and pretty much everything that we have, with the exception of very small numbers of anaerobic bacteria, which survive to this day, is an aerobe. So that means that they can process and can work with oxygen. Uh, there is competition on the multicellular level. So in this case, you see a mildew infecting a leaf. And within plants, there are defense mechanisms against mildew, which sometimes do and sometimes do not work. So in this case, the mildew is attacking the plant because it wants to make use of the resources that are within the plant. And the plant is trying to protect itself against the attack of the mildew. This one is one of my favorites. It's a really complicated relationship between plants, ants, aphids, and ladybugs. And if you take it a level up, also with farmers. So the aphids, which are these tiny little green things, they like to drink juice out of plants, and then they produce something called, uh, I think it's like honey nectar. And the honey nectar is used by the ants, who eat it and then feed it to their little baby ants as they develop. So for the ants, it's very important to keep the aphids alive because the aphids are basically producing food for them. The ladybugs love to eat the aphids. So for the ladybug, the aphid is a treat, and the ant is an enemy. So what you see in, in like even little farming fields or backyard gardens, is there's guardian ants protecting the aphids from ladybugs. And in case a ladybug comes in, the entire army attacks the ladybug just to make sure that the aphids stay alive, stay, stay alive so that the ants can make, sure, can make sure that they use their honeydew that the aphids produce. And then if you take farmers into the whole thing, farmers hate the aphids because the aphids damage their plants. So you basically have an alliance between plants, ladybugs, and farmers, against the double alliance of aphids and ants. Usually the farmer wins, but that's thanks, thanks to mostly uh, uh, insecticides, so we cheat. But still, there's technically warfare going on in this picture. Uh, and then, as we get into larger and larger organisms through uh, some amount of evolution, uh, when you get to the Cambrian explosion and the proliferation of animal life, you can basically consider this as the weaponization of anatomy. 
One of the main things that is believed to have been a trigger to the Cambrian explosion is the appearance of the world's first eyes, which would see complex images. They would have been significantly poorer in resolution than our eyes, so maybe like just 16 by 16 pixels, as we would see on the eyes of some trail device, but still it's better than just seeing nothing at all and relying on your chemical senses. So pretty much the moment that eyes appear, a whole lot of new animal kinds proliferate throughout the world's oceans, because now they can actually see where they are and where their food is, and most of the time that food being other animals, they can also run away as the animals who now evolved eyes can now see each other, it provides an oomph to the evolution of mobility, because now if you want to make sure that you can get and eat something that you want, or you want to make sure that you can get away and protect yourself from being eaten, you need to make sure that you're significantly more mobile than somebody a million years before you was, because they just had to rely on their chemical senses. Also, it led to the evolution of armor, so a lot of the animals that you see in the Cambrian explosion, they have armor to basically protect themselves against various types of hunters. And sometimes the hunters developed armor to protect themselves from each other, because even in the Cambrian Ocean, there is still competition between hunters of the same type for food of whatever choosing they had. Uh, as you continue evolving, you have the weaponization of group intelligence. So this is an example of a track alliance over the course of a day, where you see they attack a group of zebras and then attack a giraffe. And if you look at this, it almost looks like a battle map. Because the lions split up into three groups, where two of the lionesses flank the group of zebras from the side, and one of them charges in straight. And then if you look at the giraffe kill, they still do the exact same thing with two flanking attacks, but then they also add a rear attack from the rear, so the giraffe is basically surrounded. This is basically military tactics in a nutshell, but it's carried out by lions. Yeah? Do these attack patterns vary with different um, tribes of lions, or herds of lions? So, that hasn't been studied extensively much to my knowledge, but it depends on how large of a pack you have. So, if you have a group of lions where you have maybe like 5 or 10 females, then what's been observed is the lead female and some of the more sprightly females would lay in ambush. The more slow females would be used to drive a herd of animals towards the ambush, and then from a point of, basically from a point where you could strike reliably, the lead female and whatever other females were accompanying her would then strike out and usually aim for the slowest, for the slowest animal. So there is strategy that evolves and varies depending on like how big the group is, and presumably because the group size changes not even with generations but with years, uh, they would adapt their specific tactics uh, accordingly. Uh, then we have the weaponization of tools, such as this very interesting picture of an orangutan trying to spearfish. Although this doesn't actually count, or this doesn't actually count in this case, because that was just the orangutan mimicking locals that he found spearfishing, and he was never actually able to find to spear any fish himself. But a chimpanzee digging for termites using a stick is an example of using tools by itself, because this behavior was observed by chimpanzees who presumably had very limited to no human contact before their observation, and hopefully humans did not teach them to reach sticks into termite mounds so that they could eat the termites. But that would be a very sad story. And finally, we've weaponized our bodies, we have weaponized our intelligence, we have weaponized our tools. Now we weaponize science. The most classic example of weaponizing science is, of course, people would think the Manhattan Project, because you have a group of very, very intelligent scientists coming together, developing a new weapon based on modern physics, and then testing it and then using it. But if you think about it, science has been weaponized ever since humans were a thing. If you look at an ancient Egyptian chariot, there's a lot of science that goes into making this thing work. You need to know tribology, so that's the science of friction, and how things interact in, basically, in physical contact. You need to know how things react in friction so that your wheels can actually work, and your chariot isn't just going to be stuck in place. You need to know metalworking, so that you can make swords and various components for the chariot. You need to know how horse breeding works, so that you can breed better horses for your chariots, and they will not be the same emaciated zebras that you find in the middle of the savannah. You need to know how dendrology works, so you need to know which kinds of trees to choose for your goats. You need to know what kinds of trees to choose for the chariot. You need to use a different kind of tree for the wheel and for the axle, and then a different kind of tree for the body, and so on and so forth. So, 
There's a lot of science that goes on in this picture. You need to know various science, sciences related to the production and maintenance of clothing, because clothing doesn't grow in trees, well, at least not yet. So even a chariot has a lot of science and a lot of engineering built into it. Uh, and finally, we get where is what is exactly the role of military engineering? Well, number one is to provide critical advantages over your enemies. So this right here is the steel of vultures from uh, Sumeria, uh, dated to around 2500 BC. This is the earliest depiction currently found of soldiers wearing helmets. So presumably before this steel was created, helmets had been around for some time, but all of the earlier illustrations when they show people fighting each other, soldiers do not wear helmets. And this led to a very interesting conclusion by one historian, which I'm not entirely sure how valid it is, but the conclusion was that the helmet might have been the first way of defending yourself that made an entire weapon class obsolete, which is the mace. Because if you think about it, people have been using clubs to hit each other over the head since the days of the cavemen, and generally that works because the head is unprotected. However, if you put a helmet on, a helmet usually has a lighter and then the metal part, which protects the rest of the head. So when you hit something on top of the helmet, there is a bit of compliance within the helmet, thanks to the flexible liner, so that the blow is dissipated and you don't have an instant cracking motion. So if people were using maces and clubs for, let's say, a few million years to kill each other, once the helmet started being introduced and became more effective, it was no longer nearly as effective to use a mason. You would have had to use other types of weapons. This is also the oldest depiction of a tight infantry formation. So in this case, you see that the soldiers are arranged are arranged in lines, and they're standing basically shoulder to shoulder, covering each other with their shields. In earlier illustrations of military campaigns, this never was observed, so it was mostly just people coming in into a battle just one-on-one, -on -one in disarray. And if you are a single soldier trying to attack a group that has interlocking shields, a wall of spears that's sticking out, you're going to be a significant disadvantage against this new tactic that has just appeared. War can, or military engineering can also be used to help keep up with potential enemies. So a classic example of this is the, fleet, is the expansion of the Roman fleet during the First Punic War. Before the First Punic War, the Roman fleet was fairly small and mostly used for coastal guard duties because they didn't really need to have a large navy because they were not engaged in major naval operations with, against anybody up to that point. However, when the Carthaginians began the First Punic War, Rome realized that in order to compete with them in the Mediterranean, they need to have a fleet of their own. So they began a very large production uh, line of new ships. They improved on old designs that they observed the Greeks and the Carthaginians were using. The most classic example of Roman improvisation is this thing. It's called the Corvus or the Crow. This was basically a drawbridge to drop onto an enemy ship so that your, your marines can run across and then kill everybody by hand. And the reason that the Romans came up with this is they didn't have quite as much naval expertise, but their army was beyond compare. So what the Corvus did was basically it allowed to turn a naval battle into a ground battle. So once you lock in with an enemy ship, you just send your marines and then they do what they do best. Another uh, reason or another role of military engineering is to turn new discoveries into effective weaponry. One of the more classic examples of this would be the development of gunpowder. So, Gunpowder was accidentally discovered as people were looking for the elixir of youth in ancient China. And at some point, they started realizing that certain mixtures of chemicals, if you ignite them, they go poof. And initially, the groups of chemicals that were found to work, such as coal and saltpeter and sulfur, were actually warned against using by future researchers because they were dangerous to live. But at some point, people realized that if they explode, then perhaps you could kill somebody with them. So here you see examples of the first two gunpowder weapons. This is called a fire lance, which is basically a small pot, or sometimes even just a stick of bamboo, that has been filled with gunpowder, and it's at the end of a really long handle, so essentially a lance. And the way that these would be used is sometimes they'd be loaded up with pebbles, and you would light it and hold the end of the lance. And when it goes off, hopefully it would have some psychological effect, maybe throw some pebbles at, at people. Not very effective, but it was the first application of gunpowder for a military purpose. Or this is believed to be an illustration of an early grenade. 
So effectively, just a small ball that's, that's filled with gunpowder set on fire and then thrown at the enemy to explode and then send shrapnel into them. Because these early ones were often made out of porcelain, so porcelain shrapnels would have been quite sharp and some of painful. Uh, another important role, and especially in recent history, is uh, to combine relevant inventions into combat systems. So this is the Osterdeingler Panzerwagen, a 1904 armored car, one of the first armored cars ever built, and the first fully enclosed armored car ever built. So in this case, what you see is somebody who combined the automobile, which was first invented just 20 years prior to this. Somebody combining the automobile with the machine gun, which was also invented 20 years prior to this. People combining the machine gun and the automobile with new types of armor, because Right around that time, new uh, steel alloys were being developed to make sure that armor that you use on various ships could be lighter, so that the ships would be more faster and more agile, and these were eventually used on armored cars and armored trains and other vehicles as well. So there's a lot of individual inventions that happened over the course of 20 years, and ultimately all the way back to the dawn of time, that had to come together to make the Oscar Daimler Panzerwagen a reality in 1904. So this takes me to a brief outline of the course. Basically, the way that I think about military engineering history is I split it up into three eras. The first era is sort of the age of mechanical weapons, where most of our weapons were powered primarily by human strength. So even if you look at something like a big catapult, you still need some amount of human strength to load the catapult and set the spring or raise the counterweight on the trebuchet. So this is going to be the first three content lectures, two, three, and four. Then is the age of gunpowder, where gunpowder weapons appear and develop and finally proliferate throughout the world. And this is going to be lectures five, six, and seven. And then most of them is about the modern era, which is what I generally refer to as the era of engine vehicles, so things that can drive with an internal engine. And it starts in 1769 because, in point of fact, the very first self-propelled machine was built in 1769. And it was intended to ferry artillery, so technically it counts by every single parameter. And the sort of the bigger goal is to try to explain how do you get from a military which is using fairly primitive weapons, such as the Zulu Impi, who were armed with spears and cowhide shields, and sometimes little uh, daggers, to something modern like a aircraft carrier task force, where you have multiple aircraft carriers, each of which has dozens of aircraft on board, with support ships and other vessels all acting together in unison as a single fleet. Or for a slightly more hands-on example, how do you go from something like this, which is a stone arrowhead, to something like this? which is an armor-piercing, fence-stabilized, discarding savage tank craft. Yeah. So that's it for today. Thank you for attending. If anybody wants to take a look at the tank round, you are more than welcome to.